Hello everyone, I'm Yuan Lin, the Product Coordinator at Shimoku Scientific Instruments. I'll be your moderator today as we talk about optimizing your GC analysis to combat the effects of COVID-19 on lab operations. Before we get started, just a couple of notes for everyone viewing. There are a few items in the webinar console. Each of the items on the screen can be extended by clicking and dragging from the bottom right of each window. If you're like me, you might accidentally close the screen and wonder where it went. Now at the bottom of the console, there's a widget bar that will open any windows you've accidentally closed. In that widget bar, from left to right. First, you see a yellow question mark. This is for help if you experience technical difficulties during a webinar. Next, the blue projector screen is the presentation window. The red film strip next to that is the media player. The purple Q&A is our question box. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, go ahead, type your questions in the box, and submit them. At the end of the presentation, we'll be answering the questions you've submitted during both of our panel and Q&A sessions. The other blue box is the speak file if you wanted to know more about us. And finally, the green paper is our resource list. In here, you will find links to the Shimatsu Scientific Instruments website, the slides from today's presentation, poster, flyers, and application notes mentioned in this webinar. Feel free to download these anytime throughout the presentation. Okay, let's get started. Take it away, Rick. Thank you for that, Yuan, and hi, everybody. My name is Rick Sheldon. I'm the GC product manager here with Shimatsu Scientific Instruments. And I'm sure most of you are already pretty aware of this virus, so we won't go into too many details about what it is exactly, but I do want to point out just a couple details related to the health and safety and financial impacts that it's having around the world. So I'm sure you know the virus is still spreading, so these numbers are already a bit dated. The actual numbers have now surpassed 6 million confirmed cases and 350,000 deaths worldwide. So it is important to maintain a safe distance from others just to lower this transmission rate. And these preventive measures and distancing efforts are also accompanied by a financial burden as well. Here in the U.S., a lot of states have begun their reopening process, but a large portion of businesses and public organizations are still shut down. We're now several months in. We don't really have a clear end in sight. We're not really sure if there's going to be a second wave of cases as we kind of relax the stay-at-home guidances. And this type of sudden and lingering economic shock is def definitely unprecedented here in the U.S. And while I'm not an economist, I can certainly say that there's going to be lasting effects both socially and financially. First, I just want to mention how the health and safety part of the equation relates to laboratories. So labs are going to have to reopen in a very responsible manner. There are a few tactics that all businesses can use, such as staggering the shifts and breaks of employees, but this strategy generally lowers the overall productivity of a GC lab, and this is mainly because over 70% of GC labs are doing either QA, QC, or analytical services, and these are generally high-throughput labs that need a lot of user engagement to operate at peak performance. So over the next 30 minutes or so, we'll talk about some of the specific approaches labs can utilize with new and existing features that can help us practice social distancing while improving our productivity. The second part of the equation for labs to consider is how we can mitigate the financial impact of COVID-19 on our bottom lines. This essentially boils down to these two factors, revenue and expenses. Of course, we would ideally like to increase our revenue while decreasing our expenses, but this is easier said than done. If we think about it like a balance with revenue on one side and our expenses on the other, we would hope for our revenues to at least outweigh our expenses so we can run a profitable operation. COVID, while not having much of an effect on our expenses, is severely limiting our revenue, likely making our expenses outweigh our revenue. Despite our best marketing and sales efforts, it's going to be pretty difficult to add more weight to the revenue side of this balance during the pandemic. So we have much more control over reducing our expenses. So this is where we should be focusing our efforts while working through the pandemic. 
So we'll spend the second half of this presentation discussing ways to reduce expenses in the lab, specifically related to new capabilities in gas management. There are many, many ways to utilize technology to support your social distancing efforts. As I'm sure you can imagine, auto samplers are one of the best tools for this. Shimatsu has a range of auto samplers, including liquid auto samplers, headspace samplers, and these multifunctional rail systems like the image on the right here. This image on the right is our AOC 6000, and it can hold hundreds of sample vials. This model can also support a variety of sample introduction methods, including liquid, headspace, and spemi injections. All of the auto samplers I just mentioned can help automate your lab, but I do want to talk a little bit more about the AOC 6000, just because you might be surprised how much it actually can help automate your lab and accommodate a, number, a more limited number of scientists in the lab at a given time. So last year, we put together a paper for ASMS showing that we could use this AOC 6000 to drastically reduce the amount of effort related to sample prep. So here we have blood alcohol content analyses by GCFID and GCMS, and this has been around for a long time, and the standard and sample prep process has been a pain in the butt for just as long. So using a custom script, we developed a protocol to automatically prepare calibration and check standards, perform internal standard addition, and then to actually perform a headspace injection. Only two standards were prepared by the user, the stock calibration standard and the internal standard. All other standards were actually prepared by the auto sampler, and all samples were spiked with internal standard by the auto sampler. All prep and analyses were run automatically in a continuous run, and the resulting calibration curves had excellent linearities, and the check standards had reproducibility that actually exceeded state requirements. The four analytes tested were methanol, ethanol, isopropanol, and acetone, and n-propanol was used as an internal standard. A stock solution containing the four analytes and a stock solution of the internal standard were prepared, then the auto sampler was programmed to prepare five diluted standards in triplicate, and quality control check standards were also prepared in triplicate. The various dilution factors and injections were completed by switching between these three liquid syringes and the headspace syringe that you see on the bottom there. As I mentioned, the calibration curves had excellent linearities. You can see here that they each have an R-squared value of at least 0 0.999. And I'll just pause here for a moment so you can take a look. North Carolina Department of Justice requirements for the check standards, which these standards are modeled after, are plus or minus 5% of target concentration for ethanol and plus or minus 10% for all others. Looking at these data, you can see that all measured ethanol concentrations fall within 2% of actual values, and for all other analytes, the measured values fall within 5.5% of actual concentrations, which is great. So as you can see, using auto samplers properly to automate your processes is a great first step. By doing so, you can set up and begin an analysis of lots of samples and let the instrument do the work for you. However, I'm sure many of you have run into issues when putting too much faith into your auto sampler alone. Maybe you built a sequence and began your run, then went home letting your GC run overnight, only to come in the following day to learn that maybe your gas cylinder had run out midway through the run and caused a fatal error, and now you have to spend your entire morning swapping gas sources and finishing up the bats that you plan to have done already, so now you have to kind of wait until the end of the day to review that data, and you've basically wasted the whole day. Using our new software feature called Lab Solutions Direct, you wouldn't have to come into this unexpected mess the next day. You can, you can use Lab Solutions Direct on your phone or tablet to remotely monitor and even control your GC via a browser interface. This feature has a lot of use cases, including choosing methods, starting and stopping runs, reviewing results, troubleshooting, et cetera. Now let's revisit that example of an analyst who wants to run some samples overnight. You can see that most GCs have the capability to perform auto start-stop functions, which can be programmed right in the software. 
So what you can do is set up the GC to stop automatically and restart at a predetermined time. Then begin your analysis and leave the lab. This will help conserve energy over the time that you're not in the lab and also allow you to do more work remotely. And to save time upon restarting the system, we can actually perform a baseline stability check and a system suitability test to make sure that the GC is ready for analysis as soon as you get back into the lab. And we can also monitor all of these processes using Lab Solutions Direct. If your lab's anything like ours, then you may be limiting the number of people who are actually allowed in the lab at a given time. And whether the other analysts are working from home or just in their offices, et cetera, this browser interface will actually allow us to do a lot more work without needing to be in the lab. As you can see here in the image, you might want to have one attendee in the lab who can actually handle the hardware, and then a couple other analysts might be working remotely and kind of working with attendee A to uh, put in samples or perform any hardware adjustments that might be needed. So we really hope that this technology helps smooth over your transition as we move to some of these more socially distancing practices. So those are some of the ways that we can improve automation and social distancing within the lab. But now let's kind of shift our focus to reducing the cost of operation. And a lot of this cost will relate to your gas management and specifically helium. So I just wanted to include this slide to show that most of the U.S. helium is located in a single government-run reserve. It's located around northern Texas. And over the last 23 years or so, the government has really been trying to get out of this market and privatize the sale of helium. And they've mandated that this supply no longer be sold as of September 2021. With supply dwindling and demand remaining strong, prices have doubled over the last 20 years. And they've even gone up about 50% just in the last seven years. So naturally, if your lab can minimize or eliminate your helium consumption, you can save quite a bit of money in operating expenses. And some ways to reduce helium usage are either A, to minimize your gas flow during the downtime, or B, you can switch to an alternative gas during downtime, or C, you can switch to an alternative carrier gas in general, such as hydrogen or nitrogen. Shimatsu actually makes it pretty simple to minimize gas flow during downtime using our carrier gas saver mode. And this downtime can apply to a couple of different situations. The first is maybe just a method that uses a large split ratio, because what ultimately a split ratio is doing is trying to help concentrate a sample onto the column for separation, and then the rest of the gas is just kind of blown out of the split vent. So the larger the split ratio used, the more gas that is wasted during the analysis. So by turning the gas saver mode on, we can really reduce the amount of gas that's going out of the split vent without having an effect on our chromatography. To make sure that this is the case, we're going to want to set the time on the gas saver section to be more than the time that it takes for all the sample to vaporize, but less than the time that it takes for your unretained peak to elute from the column. You can see in the image on the right that I have set this time to one minute, which will meet both of these requirements. You can see that I have a split ratio set to five, and we want to use a split of at least five to one for the gas saver mode. And then the second situation you'll often come across is trying to just minimize gas use between runs. And what we recommend here is to just create a standby method with low gas flow and just add this to the end of your batch table. And this is because stopping the flow completely while idling is not good for your instrument. And we really want to keep oxygen out of the column as much as possible. So as I mentioned in the last slide, you can create a standby method with low gas flow and just add this method to the end of your batch table. And that's great because you can really lower the rate at which you're using helium but we can also combine this strategy with our new toy called the gas selector, which will allow you to very quickly and easily switch the carrier gas to something like nitrogen. So this way, we're using a much lower flow rate, but we're also using a much less expensive gas in general. 
So combining these two strategies can result in some very powerful gas savings for your lab. So this new gas selector is going to be a great tool for a lot of labs. You can see what it looks like in the picture on the right here. It's designed so that any two kinds of gases can be plumbed in at the same time, and then you could just go into the software and choose which one you want to use for a particular analysis. You can use helium and nitrogen, like the example in the last slide. You can use helium and hydrogen to compare them as carrier gases. You could even use hydrogen and nitrogen if your lab ever moves completely away from helium as a carrier gas. And here you can see how simple the user interface actually is for the gas selector. So when you're creating a method, you'll actually see this additional section for the gas selector. You can see which carrier gas the method will be using and the time remaining to complete the gas switching, which will take no longer than about 10 to 15 minutes if you're using an FID. And this ties into the theme of social distancing features nicely because you also don't have to make any hardware changes to use this gas selector, which means you can incorporate this into some of the features that we've already discussed, like the standby method that you would include at the end of a batch table when you're done with your analysis using your main gas. So you can kind of switch over to nitrogen or some other cheaper gas just until you're ready for your next run. So all you have to do is go into this easy to use interface to change the shutdown settings and click the box that says switch to sub gas while you're making your standby method. And then whenever you're ready to go back to your, your main analyses, you can select a method that uses your main gas and the system will automatically switch back over to helium or whichever main gas you're using. So I already mentioned how this feature can be used to create a standby method, but it's certainly not limited to this type of method. Another way the gas selector can be used to reduce your helium usage and save your lab money could be switching to an alternative carrier gas altogether. Usually you have to actually perform a hardware reconfiguration each time you want to switch back and forth between two carrier gases. Of course, the gas selector eliminates the need for this changeover of saving time, but that's not all. Because this process is automated, we can actually make one batch table to run methods with the different carrier gases and then compare the results directly for much faster method development. And Lab Solutions will also record the type of gas that was used for each sample for data integrity purposes. And I included this slide just to show you a few of the projects that we've done recently using carrier gases other than helium. And in each case, we saw some pretty good results. So we recently did a FAMES analysis using hydrogen. We've also done an HAA analysis using hydrogen and a pesticide analysis using hydrogen. Then we looked at ethanol impurities using hydrogen and nitrogen. We did a simulated distillation using hydrogen. And then we've looked at thiophene and benzene, and we're working on a beer analyzer, both using nitrogen. And as you can see, the majority of these were done using hydrogen. And we'll talk about some of the reasons for this, along with some tips for changing your carrier gas in the next few slides. Our customers sometimes ask if nitrogen would be a feasible replacement to helium. And as you can tell from the previous slide, the answer is yes. But there are some limitations that lead us to using hydrogen more often than nitrogen. The main limitation is that nitrogen has an optimal linear velocity that is much slower than that of hydrogen and helium, which is illustrated by the Van Impter plot here on the left. This plot shows how the HETP, or height equivalent of theoretical plates, changes with respect to the linear velocity of each gas. The lower the HETP, the more efficient the separation, which directly correlates with resolution. This means that for each gas, you want to perform your chromatography at the lowest point possible on the y-axis. And as you can see, the optimal linear velocity for nitrogen is only around 10 centimeters per second, which is quite slow. Also, as you go beyond nitrogen's optimal linear velocity, the resolution drops off very quickly. And the curves for helium and hydrogen are much more similar to one another, with two key differences. First, you can see that the optimal linear velocity for hydrogen is just a bit faster, but also hydrogen can maintain resolution better even as you go beyond its optimal linear velocity. 
Now let's just talk briefly about the different control modes possible on a GC. So Shimazu GCs can operate in one of three control modes, either constant pressure mode, constant flow mode, or constant linear velocity mode. So during an isothermal analysis, or one where the temperature is held constant throughout the run, then the pressure, flow, and linear velocity would each remain constant, but most of the time we're using temperature ramps to affect our GC separations. So the plots on the left here show how the pressure, flow, and linear velocities would each change with temperature in the different modes. So the top left plot shows that if we held the pressure constant and increased the temperature, then the linear velocity and the flows would both decrease quite rapidly. And the plot below that shows that if we held the flow rate constant, then the linear velocity would increase as temperature increases. And these are both problems because if you remember back to the Van Diemter plot, that operates based on the linear velocity. So if we want to maintain the optimal efficiency, we really need to operate using the constant linear velocity mode. But regardless of whichever mode you choose, it's important to remember that the GC only monitors the head pressure and then uses this variable to hold either the pressure, flow rate, or linear velocity constant. So please just be mindful to enter in the carrier gas type and the column dimensions properly in order to make sure that the linear velocity and column flow rates are calculated accurately. And there's another important benefit to using the constant linear velocity mode as well. And this is related to method development. So by operating in this mode and also holding the linear velocity constant between methods using two different carrier gases, you should notice that your analytes should have the same retention time. The only difference you should expect is a little difference in peak width, and this is based on whether the linear velocity used for that method was the optimal linear velocity of gas. And this characteristic combined with the gas selector basically means that you can very easily compare your results using helium to chromatic ramps that were collected using hydrogen and if your resolution is maintained, then you can know that you'll be, you'll be able to easily migrate that particular method over to hydrogen. And here are some data from a haloacetic acid app note that Yuan Lin, our moderator, published recently. And this really drives this point home. So you can see that the 12 analytes were well resolved using both hydrogen and helium, and the retention times were nearly identical. And this is true of two different columns that we used for this analysis. Understandably, people are sometimes hesitant to increase their reliance on hydrogen, and this is mainly because hydrogen is an explosive gas. The most famous explosion was probably the Hindenburg in 1937, but there are also several examples of more recent incidents. Most of these, though, stem from poorly handled or poorly stored gas cylinders. Other hesitations for using hydrogen are, one, that chromatography results can sometimes be affected. When you're using an FID, the detector does require a source of hydrogen for fuel for the FID flame. So if you're using hydrogen as a carrier gas as well, this additional fuel can somewhat reduce the consistency of the FID flame which might increase the baseline noise slightly. And this can make quantitation at the lower concentration levels a bit more difficult. If low level quantitation is more important to you than optimal resolution, then you might want to consider operating the GC in constant flow mode, which would keep the hydrogen being fed into the FID a bit more consistent. And hydrogen is also a reducing agent in most cases, though, the activation energy for this reduction is too high, and you'll not actually see this reduction take place, but please be mindful of that if your sample contains compounds that are easily reduced. So continuing on with the point from the last slide regarding safety, hydrogen is actually only combustible when it is above 4% by volume in air. And like I mentioned previously, there have been some instances when hydrogen cylinders were managed poorly, and this resulted in an explosion. But because of this reason, I always recommend that labs take advantage of hydrogen generators when possible, 
which supply gas on demand, and they don't really store much gas in the generator itself. So in the case of GC, this usually only requires about 500 cc per minute on the high end. So if your FID were to go out, you would actually be pumping some hydrogen into the lab, but this is generally not a concern. Because of the size of most labs and OSHA's ventilation requirements, you would actually never be able to hit that lower 4% explosive limit in a lab. The GC oven, however, is a much smaller space, so you could reach the 4% limit here if there's some sort of leak in the oven. So Shimazu offers a hydrogen sensor, which monitors the hydrogen levels within the GC oven, and this sensor will alert you if you get to 1% uh, volume by air inside the oven, and it will ultimately shut the system down if you reach 2% by volume. So by using the gas generator and a hydrogen sensor together, hydrogen is actually quite safe. So before we wrap up, I do want to spend just a couple minutes talking about one specific project that we did use hydrogen for to improve a few different aspects of the analysis. So as you can see, we were looking at AOAC method 996.06, which is a FAMES analysis. And in the method, it calls for a linear velocity of around 18 centimeters per second, which as you can see, leads to a, a runtime of over an hour, but it also leads to some co-elution in the second half of the run. So we wanted to address a couple different parameters to improve this analysis. So what we ultimately did we switched to hydrogen as a carrier gas, and then we also increased the linear velocity to something more appropriate to be in line with the optimal linear velocity for hydrogen. So we, we use a linear velocity for hydrogen of 35 centimeters per second, and I'll show you here in the next slide just what that looked like. So here is the chromatogram for the new and improved method that we were able to develop. And the first thing you'll notice on the chromatogram on top is the dead time is actually now about cut in half. It's closer to five minutes, whereas it was close to 10 minutes in the previous slide. Then the second thing you'll notice, the resolution in those previously co-eluting peaks is now quite good. All of these peaks are baseline resolved. And then the last thing you'll notice over on the right-hand side is that the runtime is actually cut in half as well. So we're closer to 30 minutes on that now, whereas that was about an hour in the previous slide. So all of these factors combined results in quite a bit better analysis. So to those of you who've stuck with us to this point, I, I do appreciate your time. And I know we kind of got into the weeds there towards the end, kind of going into some method development and details about hydrogen as a carrier gas. But I do think it's important because if you are able to migrate some of your helium methods over to hydrogen, it will be a great way to lower some operating expenses of the lab. So just to uh, summarize what we talked about here, um, I do think that two main focus points moving forward are going to be kind of increasing our social distancing efforts and automating as many processes as we can. And then, like I said, reducing expenses where possible. So some of these tie into using auto samplers with large sample capacity, utilizing software automation when capable, utilizing software remote monitoring capabilities, creating standby methods with lower temp and gas flow when not running samples, using automatic gas switching devices to save on helium without changing validated methods, or if you are able to change your method, using an alternative carrier gas like hydrogen. And with that, we'll open it up to any questions that were asked along the way. So we'll take a look through the call queue and we'll try to answer your questions the best we can. But if we, for some reason, don't have an answer to your question or we just don't get to it here, uh, please don't worry, we will follow up with you in a separate email just to make sure you get all of your questions answered. So with that, thank you for joining us, and I hope you all have a great day. All right. Uh, thank you so much for the great presentation. Um, now, uh, looking at the, the question list, it seems like uh, there are 
Many people interested in alternative carrier gas, uh, meaning using hydrogen or nitrogen as the uh, instead of the helium. Now, we uh, in the presentation we talked a little bit about uh, how great it is to use hydrogen as a carrier gas. Um, when would it be? I want to uh, go into a little bit about um, when would be a good time to use nitrogen as carrier gas. Now, even though you know theoretically nitrogen um, has a very low linear velocity um, at its optimal uh, resolution or HETP, in in practice, it's actually not so bad. You do see peak broadening with nitrogen, especially if you're doing isothermal uh, oven program. But if you have a oven ramping program, a lot of times you don't even notice the difference when you on nitrogen carrier gas. And nitrogen carrier gas do have the advantage of being more inert than the uh, helium carrier gas, I mean, hydrogen carrier gas, also uh, safer. Now, um, there are, may I, there are, uh, I sent out a, a response earlier regarding application specific, um, advantage of using nitrogen as carrier gas. So imagine if you're analyzing a gas sample that has nitrogen as its matrix. If you use nitrogen carrier gas, then the matrix becomes invisible. And that would be a huge advantage of using nitrogen as your carrier gas. Another example would be, say you're doing ECD analysis and nitrogen is already your makeup gas. And if you use nitrogen as your carrier gas, you know, given that it doesn't affect your chromatogram otherwise, again, you have one gas, and then you can do your entire analysis. That would be another um, advantage of using nitrogen as your carrier gas. Um, and again, you know, having, not having to use the tank, using uh, just the generator would provide a lot of convenience for certain labs. So these are uh, a few comments I want to uh, add to our presentation. Um, mostly I want to say using alternative carrier gas, it is a trial and error thing. There's a lot of, uh, you probably should try it, and it doesn't hurt to, to try it, and it works, then, you know, win-win situation. Yeah, and Yuan, um, in the presentation, I pointed out a few of the different applications that we, we did run some alternative carrier gases on, and you did use nitrogen on the, the beer analyzer. Do you, do you want to just talk briefly about kind of what those results looked like? So beer analyzer is a system where the analytes are well separated to begin with, and also, so we, we do, so uh, let's, let me step back and talk a little bit about the analyzer. It is a three-in-one analysis where one headspace injection from the uh, beer headspace um, onto two different columns, one going into ECD, which analyzes the diacetyl, and then the other one goes to, uh, and then half of the effluent goes to FID, which does two analysis, one for ethanol content and the other for the uh, flavor compounds. Um, the compounds are pretty well separated to begin with, so I don't have a whole lot of, you know, punching resolution issues uh, where nitrogen is a suitable carrier gas. And also because I was using ECD, where nitrogen at the same time serves as a makeup gas to the ECD. So it simplifies the analysis. And of course, it keeps the cost down when you're doing nitrogen carrier gas. So, okay, um, let me get to some of our other questions. We have a question here. Um, can hydrogen be used for pesticide um, analysis? What would be the rate of nitrogen-containing compounds during ionization? Will there be reduction observed? So this is a mass spec-specific question. So we did show in the slide, Rick, you can talk about like the, the slide where we actually show the results. 
slide. Yeah, so the slide titled Hesitation to Using Hydrogen, it does show, so the last point we made there was that nitro-containing compounds do actually get reduced in the ion source of a GCMS. Um, so, so that's one of the, the situations that you want to be mindful of. But there are a lot of cases when you might expect that a reaction is going to take place. For example, during the FAMES analysis that we did, there are some, um, there's some unsaturated bonds that you might expect to be reduced. But then when we, when we took a closer look and we, we measured both the saturated and unsaturated versions, we noticed that that, that reaction actually did not happen. So, so the nitro-containing compounds in the pesticide analysis might be an issue, but a lot of the times you'll actually get away with, with, the, uh, with, the, with the run without the reduction happening. And that's kind of because the activation energy is a bit too high in a lot of these cases. And I see a question here from uh, uh, about the efficiency of gas generators. So I'm actually uh, coming from a sales background selling gas generators, and I can tell you that the hydrogen generator is a, a great option because, um, first of all, they can be they can get very pure. You can get up to seven or almost eight nines purity. But then, even more importantly, the safety advantages of the hydrogen generator are pretty relevant because they don't actually store gas on the on board the generator. It produces it on demand. So you're going to be pumping out such a small volume that if it's just going into the room, you're never going to be able to hit that 4% explosive limit as long as the room's ventilated appropriately. And then the only place you're going to maybe have that build up is in the oven. And like I mentioned, we have a hydrogen sensor. So that will let you know when you're getting to 1%, and then it will actually shut your system off when you get to 2%. So the combination of those two factors really makes gas generators and the uh, hydrogen sensor a really safe option. Let's take a look at some more questions. So, Rick, uh, we have a question here uh, asking about lab solutions direct. Could that just be a replacement for lab solutions? Yeah, I see that. So, no, lab solutions direct will not replace your lab solutions software. It's actually just a feature that's available within the software. And you don't need any special features or add-ons to use it. You just need access to a web browser with a compatible device. But like I said, it's not a replacement for lab solutions. It is a bit limited in terms of what you can um, change on the system configuration. So you can run your methods and you can see some of these results and things like that, but you can't actually go in and change your system configuration. Um, I see. So, um, another question uh, regarding the copper tubing uh, that you mentioned in your presentation that uh, you should not use copper tubing with hydrogen carrier gas. Um, can you answer why that is? Yeah, so, so copper tubing, when it's exposed to hydrogen, can actually become uh, brittle over time and actually break. So stainless steel tubing is uh, a safer option when you're using hydrogen. Um, I, I see a question that relates to the, uh, the 10 to 15 minute time frame that I mentioned when you are switching carrier gases using the gas selector and kind of why that's necessary and what's happening. So uh, Yuan, would you? Just go into some of the details about kind of what's happening during that time and what it would be like to do some of those things without the gas selector. Yes, absolutely. 
Um, so that 10 to 15 minutes uh, wait time, the gas selector actually is going through a pre-programmed pressure and purge, pressure and purge cycle. Um, the default is like every 20 seconds, it drops the gas pressure by 100 kPa and then it goes built back up. So it efficiently purge out all the pipes that um, could potentially contain the other gas. Now, uh, all these are programmable, which means you can all change the cycle time, the pressure drops, um, how long it takes to purge, to customize to your specific needs. 10 to 15 minutes um, should be sufficient for um, almost all detectors, including MS, um, by, uh, if you allow sufficient total flow and you know, this is a good cycle time. We recommend um, about you know, 1.5 liters of total gas to be uh, purged through um, in order to get everything uh, cleaned away and replaced with alternative gas. But the good thing is you don't have to do this manually. There's just uh, the method that's already written into the flow controller, so it, it automatically does everything for you, makes it easier on the user. And when it changes, it actually writes into the method which, um, which gas you'll be currently using, so there will be no mistake. Um, so just another question about whether cost aside, if it's still better to use hydrogen or nitrogen. So I think we've we've gone into some of those details already, but it's just important to remember that um, there are some advantages to hydrogen, and if you can get away with it because there's no reactions that are happening in your analysis, that might be the better alternative. But at the same time, um, nitrogen is a great alternative. So as long as that works for your method and you don't lose too much resolution, then then there's no problem going to nitrogen either. Okay, well, um, I think that's just about all the questions that we see here, and um, there are just a couple that we don't have the answer to, so we will follow up with you guys offline, and um, hopefully everybody gets their questions answered. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. And Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.